God did not make death. God did not make death, nor does he rejoice in the destruction of the living. This is what we hear in the first reading. This is an epic statement of faith. God did not make death, and he does not rejoice in the destruction of the living. Or we might say, God is not a spectator to the troubles of humanity. God is not a spectator on the sidelines while humanity suffers. God is not an absentee father, oblivious of the problems of his children. Now, this is the great argument of the atheist, right? The person who doesn't believe in God, says there is no God. This is the argument. See all the suffering in the world? See all the problems, people dying, wars and violence and tragedies? If God is so real, so powerful, so good, where is he? What's he doing? Right? Why isn't he fixing the mess? This is the argument. And as Catholics, we need to be able to have a response. And what is the response? When someone says, where is God? What's he doing? Dying on the cross for us, rising from the dead for us, destroying the power of sin and death for us, open the gates of heaven for us, working in billions of people's lives every moment of every day. God is radically involved in the human race. God is radically involved in our lives. But God is not our butler. He does not exist to just clean up our messes. God is a father. God wants to be our father who guides his children so we can become good, holy children of God. God is our friend who wants to be there and with us and sharing in our joys and sorrows. And God, this is the great message of Christianity, that not only does God want to be our father, which is revolutionary, not only does God want to be our best friend, but God wants to be the very spouse of our soul, filling us with his very life and his very presence. And one of the problems in our lives as as Catholics, one of the problems that we have in this world in our relationship with God is that many times we treat God like we think he should be our butler rather than our father, friend, and spouse of our soul. And it's not good for God to, to just always let us treat him like our butler, right? What happens with a, a butler, you know, employer relationship? You start, okay, I need you to do this, 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 this. All right, bye. Have a good day. And many times our prayer life is like that. Okay, God, I need you to do this for this person. I need you to do this. I need you to do this. I need you to do this. If you could have it all done by 530, that'd be great. You know, imagine in a family, if, if every morning, you know, the parent sets out breakfast for their, for their kid, and their, their 12-year-old child comes walking down and says, all right, mom, here's the list. I need you to take me to, to school, then I need you to go to this, the um, uh, store and get me this and this and this, and then you need to pick me up at this time. All right, have a good day. Bye. Every day? Like, wait a second. <laughs> what is this type of relationship? I can tell you what type of relationship it is. That kid thinks they're God, thinks they're the center of the known universe, and if a parent caves to that and just lives that way and says, wait, don't treat me like this. Let's sit down and actually have a conversation. Let's actually be a family. I'm not your butler. Yes, parents do lots of things for their children, but not as their butler, as their parent. And so this is one of the things that I want to look at today is, is... what is the answer to suffering, and how do we pray and open our hearts, hearts to God? God allows suffering because, one, we have free will, and our free will has consequences, right? If I punch myself in the face, I can't be like, why did God let me, my, let me, my face hurts, why does God allow that? God's going to be like, uh, duh, you're punching yourself in the face, cause, effect. You want to not have that effect? Don't do the cause, like stop punching yourself in the face, right? We have free will, and our free will can affect things, not only in our own lives, but can affect things generationally, culturally, world, globally. You know, the tyranny of the sin can, can radically affect the world. And God allows us to have free will. Where he doesn't treat us like robots. You can go this far, and then I will physically stop you. I'll, you know, make it so you can't. No. The beauty of love, 
necessitates means we have to have free will. In order to be able to love God, in order to be able to love, I have to have free will. And that tragically means I can choose. And in the beginning, God created a world without suffering. He created a world without death. He created a world without sin. He created a world where we were protected from tornadoes and all sorts of craziness. He created a world where we were so radically filled with grace that we could know him and love him easily. We could experience great joy. We didn't have this craziness going on inside of us and around us. And we messed it up. God did not make death. We did. We brought death into the world. When we broke that original covenant with God, there were consequences. When we rejected that original grace, there are consequences. Humanity without that grace falls apart, just as any material thing falls apart. We had that grace in the garden, this garden of Eden grace, um, the grace of original justice and holiness, if you want to get specific, and we lost that grace. And God allows us to have the consequences of our actions means we have to now deal with tornadoes and, and hailstorms and all sorts of craziness. It means we can harm each other and harm ourselves and, and harm nations you know, by our actions. But God has not abandoned us. He has not just said, eh, tough. Look what you did. Right? He's not an absentee father. When he sees his children, he sees us in a mess that we've created out for ourselves, that we've brought upon ourselves. What does he do? We look at the Old Testament, we see again and again and again he reaches out to the prophets, again and again and again he reaches out uh, to the patriarchs, again and again and again he reaches out until ultimately he comes himself to this earth in Jesus Christ and takes on our suffering, takes on our death, destroys the power of it, opens up the gates of heaven, not to take us back to the garden. That was never the original goal. Right? This is what we get confused. We think, okay, if God really loves me, he'll make my life easy, no suffering. You know, he'll make, he'll make the garden happen for me. He'll make this perfect world for me where everything's great and I can just sit down and drink margaritas and relax and watch TV. That was not the purpose of creating the human race. I talked about this last week. The purpose of creating human, the human race was that we could share in the very infinite love of God so we could actually abide in the very presence of God so we can actually share in the very love that the Father, Son, and have for each other in the Holy Trinity. We are created for union with the infinite God, not for union with the comforts of the garden, right? The com- we were, Adam and Eve wouldn't have lived there for all eternity. They would have lived there as long as God willed, been fruitful and multiplied, and then eventually gone to heaven without having to experience suffering and death because we were made for union with God. Union with an infinite, all-powerful God. So, once we believe that, we say, okay, what do I want out of life? I don't want God, just take away my pain, take away my suffering, create the garden for me. No, what do I want out of life? You, God, you directly. I want you and whatever you wish to give me. I want your love, your presence, your grace, and whatever you think I need. That radically changes our prayer and opens up doors to massive amounts of grace. If we give God a list, God, I need you to do this, 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 this. Sometimes that answer is going to be yes. Sometimes that answer is going to be no. Because God's smarter than us. He knows what's best for us. God, I want to win the lottery. Can you please, Powerball, make this happen? God's going to be like, no, that'll destroy your life. But I'll use it for good, I promise. I know you. It's not going to happen. You're going to eat a million pizzas and die of a heart attack. It's, going to, it's not going to It's not good. So how do, we, how do we do this? So I want to give a real practical example of how we could pray in a way that respects this, respects that we're made for union with God himself. We're made for God to be our father, a best friend, and a spouse of our soul, and actually ex- and open our hearts to him, and not just tell him what to do, but to invite him into our lives and open our hearts to what he wants to do. It's a radically different way of praying than, most, than a lot of people grow up. They grow up just giving God the list, and they, then they say, like, well, nothing really happened. It's like their prayer life becomes letting balloons go off into the sky. It's, I, it's my wish. This is my birthday wish. It's my birthday wish. And there's nothing wrong with telling God what's on our heart. But we want to make sure that we're not treating God like a butler, but we're having a relationship with him as father, best friend, and spouse to our soul. Okay, so how does this work? First, so this is, I'm going to teach, this is how we kind of pray through our day, pray through our emotions, pray through what's going on. 
First, we acknowledge what we're going through. We acknowledge what we're, what's going on in our life. We be real with God. All right? If you're frustrated, tell God you're frustrated. Don't be like, oh, God, I'm not frustrated. You know, he can see our hearts. He knows. And we, don't, we don't try to just ignore it. We don't try to pretty ourselves up. There's no, there's no, there's no spiritual makeup that it can kind of, kind of uh, cover up those blemishes, right? We just go to God. This is where I'm at. This is what's going on in my life. I had a bad day. I had a good day. I had a, I'm frustrated at this. I'm sad about this. Whatever it is, I acknowledge what I'm feeling. I acknowledge what I'm going through. Feelings in themselves are not good or evil. They're just feelings. The reactions to what we're going through. How we live, how we choose to act on those feelings can be either good, I'm going to pray for this person, or bad, I'm going to punch this person. You know, they can be either good or bad. So we acknowledge what we're feeling, and we, then we place it in God, the presence of God. We relate it to God. Acknowledge what we're feeling, relate it to God, share it with God, invite God to be with us. You know, usually we're tempted to just immediately jump, take this away, Lord, make this go away, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Have a nice day, God. Thanks. But what do we got? What's our goal? Our goal is union with God. Our goal is sharing his life. Our goal is time with him, right? We want to, what do we want most? I want to be with God. That's what I want most. Whether he does what I want him to do or not, that's not what I'm in this for. I'm in this for to spend time with him, to be close to him. That's what I want. And so we share this. God, will you please be with me? I'm feeling frustrated right now. Will you please be with me and share this with me? Kind of like a best friend, kind of like a family member sits there with us. And we focus on his presence and just let his presence be enough for us in that moment. Now, okay, I need you to do this and this and this and this. No, I just need you to be with me. I'm going to share this and focus on his presence. And then we ask to receive what he wants to give. We know that God is good. We know that when God sees our sufferings, right, he does not rejoice in the destruction of the living. He does not rejoice in the destruction of the living. God is not an absentee father. He's not a spectator. He sees us sad. He sees us happy. He sees us suffering. He sees us dying of cancer. He sees us going through troubles in our marriage. He sees us going through troubles at school. He has a response. He wants to do something. And maybe that's not fixing everything around us because people have free will, right? We'll just change him, change him, change him, change him, change him. And if you could get my salary up a little bit, then I'll be fine, God. He wants to work inside of us. Right, that involves lots of people's free will. And he's trying to work in their lives. But if we think our happiness is from everything around us being fine, we're delusional. Happiness is union with God. So Lord, what do you want to give? Right now, you're enough. Just being with you is enough. Is there anything you want to say or do? I want to open my heart. I know you're good. I know you're holy. I know you want to act right now. So what do you want to do? And we open our hearts to his word and receiving his word. His word is not just some intellectual word, right? If he tells us he loves us in that moment, oh, it's like, oh I heard that in third grade, God. You know, what else you got? His word is powerful. His word can calm a storm. His word can create a universe. His word can raise the dead. And so when we hold on to his word, his word is like a seed. It's going to do something if we hold on to it and not just let it bounce off. Or not let it fall on thorns and thistles. That's great, God, but could you really do this? No, God, this is what you said. Okay, so we're struggling. I'm frustrated. I'm angry about something. I'm angry at my boss. I'm angry at a spouse. Whatever it is, I'm angry about the situation. What do you want to say or do? He might say to us something like, be still and know that I am God. Something in the scriptures. And that's not just some intellectual thing. Sit there with it. Let it be a word, that, a word of life. You know, it's like something radioactive. You hold on to it, it's going to do something. Radioactive is going to kill you, but <laughs> the word of God is a source of life. You still know that I am God. That word can actually calm our hearts. That word is powerful. And then we respond to that word. We hold on to it, let it, let it minister to our soul, and we respond. Thank you, Lord, that you're God. I am not. I can be still and receive your love and just be present to you. You know? Um, or you could say, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Yes, Lord, I'm sorry. I forgive this person. You've been so merciful to me. You didn't give up on me when I was lost. You kept fighting for me, so I'm going to forgive. And then we go repeat, you know, until we get to a place of peace or, you know, it's dinner time. We got to go. You know, it's, we run out of time. What this does is it, it opens, it, it's honest with God. This is where I'm at. This is what I'm going. I'm sharing my life with God. But it's not going to God with a laundry list as our butler, it's saying, I just want to be with you. I want to share this with you. And I know you're good. Is there anything you want to say or do? I'm going to open myself up to what you want to say or do. Powerful things can happen. 
Powerful things can happen in our lives when we do that. I've experienced that myself personally. I've seen that with many, many other people. So imagine, for example, two situations. One, husband and wife. Right? When couples get married, one of the temptations in couples is that they treat each other as God. Or they treat each other as a garbage dump. Right? I'm frustrated with life. What am I going to do? I'm going to go home and vent to my spouse. How was your day? Blah, 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 blah. Boss, blah, 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 blah. Family, blah, 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 blah. Mother-in-law, blah, 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 blah. You know. And day in and day out, they just pour out their toxic waste on each other. And they vent on each other. Is that marriage? Right? I'll be with you and vent on you all the days of my life. No, marriage is meant to be an instrument of grace for each other. They're meant to be an instrument of God for each other, not an instrument of dumping all their junk and dumping all their toxicity on each other. Right? That's treating a spouse like God. Well, Father, I've got to tell someone it's marriage. Aren't you supposed to share everything? You are supposed to share God and grace and what is good and holy. The toxicity, all the negativity, all the, all the poison is supposed to go to God. He alone can handle it, right? This is why there are families where husband sits and watches television and a wife is like, blah, 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 blah. He doesn't know how to handle it because for 20 years, she's just dumped on him and doesn't know how to handle it because he's not God. And she gets frustrated and frustrated. Why don't you, why don't you receive this? And you know, He's not God. He can't carry that level. Or they just start to ignore. Like the husband, frustrated and angry, so what does he do? Grabs a beer and turns on the television. He doesn't want to dump it on his family, so he just holds it in until he explodes in some type of horrible, vicious sin or some blow-up. That's not healthy either. So what do we do? Different situation, husband, wife, have a frustrating day. So they, what do they do? They say, I need to go pray. I need to bring this to God. And they go to pray, and they share this with the Lord, and they experience Him speaking to their heart. So that when husband says, honey, how was your day? It's not, here's all these things and why you should hate my boss and why you should condemn him too and why you should want to... That's all gossip and sin and detraction. Versus, no, this is a frustrating day. There was a lot of drama at work when I was praying. I really felt like the Lord was saying to me, forgive as the Lord has forgiven. A husband can come in and say, instead of saying, oh, how horrible is he? He's a jerk. You should quit that job. Honey, can I pray with you? And he puts his hand on her shoulder and says, Father, I thank you for my wife. Thank you for our life and this job, as difficult as it is. Will you please fill my wife with your grace, with your love, and with this grace to forgive as you're calling her to. Come, Holy Spirit, with this grace of mercy. Women, isn't that what you want? What you want a husband that just, not just, just hears you vent, but actually prays with you? Men, isn't that what you need to do? It's not just, she know often, she, what she's looking for is communion, is union. She's looking for is not advice. Often women know what, they, know what they're needing to do and vice versa with men. You know, but you can actually be an instrument of grace. Instead of just stirring the pot of anger and wrath, to actually be an instrument of grace, an intercessor. Imagine this with kids. Imagine this with kids. Kids grow up, of course, lots of experiences, good and bad, lots of difficulties. They don't know how to handle them. They've got to learn how to, how to deal with them. So imagine 12-year-old use you know, the, the kid in the gospel was 12 years old. And there's a whole thing there, but I'm running out of time. Um, imagine, kid, probably, what, 12 years old, 6th grade? Is that middle school? 12th grade? Okay. Middle school, there's this thing called drama, I hear, that there's happening in middle school. I could solve, I think, 95% of all drama in middle school and high school if people started with their day with about 30 minutes of prayer. 30 minutes of actually encountering God, countering the very love of God, experiencing God showing up in their lives, they wouldn't be, le- they wouldn't be tempted to tear each other apart. You know, they wouldn't be so vicious. So let's say you have a vicious day at school. Someone just, just goes off the deep end, which can happen. You're like, why are you picking on me? You're sitting in the front row. What do you want? You know? <laughs> no. And imagine mom, dad doesn't say just, how was your day? Fine. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Give them a response, you know. But moms, mom and dad say, what, what happened today that we could pray for, that we could pray through? You know, whether the kid's 12 or 6, maybe by 12 they already know how to do this and they're doing it themselves. They say, okay, God, we, uh, so this, this person was, was mean to me, and instead of saying, I'm going to get that person, I'm going to call their parent, which, you know, there's a time and place for that. But first thing, what's a parent's role? To foster communion with God 
to foster a relationship with God and their child, to help their child get to God. Not just, I'm going to change this, I'm going to fix this, I'm going to... There's time and place for that. But number one is, this kid needs to encounter the grace of God. You can't protect your kid from all the sufferings in the world, but you can teach them how to encounter God in any suffering, in any situation. So the kid says, you know, this is a tough day at school, and someone said something mean to me. Uh, and say, well, do you want to pray through that? Can we pray through that? Yeah. So do you, do you, um, uh, do you offer this feeling of, of sadness and anger uh, to God right now? Yeah. You know, whatever. Uh, and what do you think God might be saying as you focus on him and just spend time with him? Uh, that he loves me. Now, that could just be something in their head that they know, which is great. Or God could actually be telling them right in that moment that he loves me, that I'm his child. And they take that in. And they experience the anger and the sadness starting to dissipate because they have a real encounter with the love of God. And they pray, thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you for creating me and seeing who I am, even if others don't. Imagine that kid doing that day in and day out. Is that kid going to leave the church? Is that kid going to not believe in God? That kid's going to grow up radically knowing the power of God in their life, radically knowing that God wants to be intimately involved in their life, and experiencing real love. This is, so this is my encouragement, uh, is the Lord wants to have a real relationship with us. He wants to be radically involved in our lives, not to just take away our problems and give us a vacation type of life, but to give us communion with him. This world is a mess, and there are things that we are called to fix, but in everything, we are called to seek communion with God. We're called to open our hearts to what he wants to do, trusting that he's good, and he has real grace to give us, but most of all, what he has to give us is his very self and his very presence. So at the entryway of the church, now, I'm not going to, I printed out a sheet of paper last week. I'm not going to do this every single week, you know, I, you know um, but I printed out a list of these steps, you know, and acknowledge what we're feeling, relate it to God, share it with God, try to receive what he wants to give, trusting in his goodness, and then responding to that. And this would be my encouragement. Parents, try this with your kids. Practice this with them. It might be awkward at first, but it could be powerful. Um, Spouses. Could you say to your spouse sometime today or tomorrow, sometime this week, can I pray with you like Father Matt said? And what's going on in your life? What's what's going on that we could pray for? What's going on in your heart that we could pray through? And to just try it. Yeah, at first it might be super awkward. I'll do this with with engaged couples. I'll try to teach them how to do this because I think it's so critical to actually having a communion with God, and a deep spiritual connection with your spouse. Or, you know, if you don't have kids, not, not married like myself, you know, to just do this. Say, all right, God, I know that I've got a life that's going on, and there are good things and so joys and sorrows, and, there's, and you want to be involved in the, in the midst of it, even in the mess of it, you want to be involved. Not to, not to just take away all the mess, but to bring yourself, to bring your grace, to bring your word. And if we do this, and we practice this, He promised, he promised, if you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you. He didn't promise that whatever you ask, whenever you ask it, I'll do for you like your butler, right? He says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do, which means under my authority, under my fatherhood, according to my will, right? If we ask what God wants to give, it will always happen. If we ask what God wants to give, when he wants to give it, when we have the right dispositions, it will always happen. But no, more, but no matter what, he said, I am with you always. He calls us to abide in his very love. And we spend time with him. We seek him. We will find him. And we will find a peace the world cannot give. We will find a love that nothing on earth can compare to because we will find the very infinite presence of the one who loves us, the one who wants to bring us ultimate healing. The ultimate healing, of course, which is communion with him himself. Uh, and as we, um, as we continue with Mass, we can bring all of our hurts and pains, place them on the altar, and know that he is not a God who is an absentee father. He is not a God who is a spectator. Where is God in the midst of the suffering of the world? Where is God in the midst of the tragedy of the world? On the cross. He died for us. He conquered death for us. He rose from dead for us. And he wants to act in our lives very powerfully to bring us new life, to make all things new in Him, to bring us into communion with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.